So how can we handle deadlocks? One way is to ensure that the system never enters a deadlock state. This can be done by deadlock prevention or deadlock avoidance. We will be talking about deadlock prevention in this video and avoidance in the next video. Or uh, an alternative is you can allow the system to enter a deadlock state and then try to recover from the deadlock. That will be discussed later. <laughs> One other uh, approach, though it looks silly, it's a very commonly used approach, you ignore the possibility of a deadlock happening. So you pretend that deadlocks never occur in the system. And what happens if a deadlock occurs? Well, the user will just wait for the system to do uh, something for some time. Ultimately, the user will get bored, say there is a problem with my system, and for example, reboot the computer. So when the computer is rebooted, you solve the problem of a deadlock. Of course, it's possible that later you will experience the same deadlock once again. But the same deadlock occurring over and over is not very likely, although not impossible. So in most cases, in many operating systems, including even Linux, definitely for Windows and Mac OS, uh, this is being done. So in, your, in other words, in your regular desktop operating systems, they simply ignore the possibility of a deadlock if the deadlock occurs. Anyways, the user will just break the deadlock in a forceful man manner. Anyways, we will be continuing with ways of preventing deadlocks. So how can you prevent a deadlock? Remember, we had four conditions that should hold simultaneously. So if you can break one of these conditions, that will be sufficient to uh, prevent the deadlocks. So the first condition was, remember, mutual exclusion. Well, you need to make mutual exclusion if there's at least one writer process and the remaining processes, there should be more processes. A writer process alone, it will not be in a deadlock. But if there are multiple writer processors or it, uh, at least one writer process and multiple reader processes, in that case, definitely you need uh, mutual exclusion for the writer process. But if it's all reader processes, like if you're reading from read-only files, you will never have a deadlock because that read-only file is a shared resource. You don't need mutual exclusion there. But as I said, if we have non-shareable resources, well, in that case, you need mutual exclusion. So in that case, you cannot break the mutual exclusion uh, condition. The second condition was, remember, hold and wait condition. So uh, you must guarantee that whenever a process wants to make use of a resource, it's not holding any other resources. So pay attention, the name of the condition is hold and wait. So don't never be holding anything while you're waiting. So if you don't have if any uh, resources, allocated to you when you uh, start waiting for another process, you will have broken that hold and wait condition. So this requires that the uh, processes request and they are allocated uh, resources, all the resources it needs at the very beginning. Okay, so when the process starts, it says, well, during my execution time, I will need this list of resources. Give all of them to me. If you cannot give all of them, then this process will not start at all. So you will not have that hold and wait condition. Because if you were waiting uh, for a resource, you would not have started at all. Or you can allow the processes to request the resources only when it is not holding any other resource. However, this approach ends up in low resource utilization and even starvation could be possible because the process uh, tries to ask for resources only if uh, it doesn't if it doesn't hold anything, and that condition never holds, so it could go into starvation. The third uh, condition was remember no preemption rule. So we were assuming that a process cannot forcibly 
get the resource assigned to another process. Now, if a process is holding some resource uh, request, so it has some uh, request, and uh, it's sorry, it's holding some resources, and it requests one more resource, then and if it cannot get that resource immediately, it will just drop all the resources it's holding. This way, uh, you have you preempt actually all the resources a process has uh, if it's going to go into the wait state. Therefore, this is closely related with the previous condition, which was hold and wait. And uh, preempted resources, now, since it released all the resources it had in hand before it started waiting, now the wait condition is not only that new resource it was waiting for, but also the ones it has dropped. So it's now waiting for more resources. Like if it was already holding K and it was asking for the K plus first resource, which was not immediately available, it will drop also the K resources in hand. Therefore, it will be waiting for K plus one resources now. And uh, the process will be restarted. It will be allowed to continue when it can gain all of those K plus one resources. Again, this is not uh, good in terms of resource utilization, and this can also lead in starvation. And finally, uh, remember the circular uh, weight condition, which was a uh, process P1 was waiting for P2, P2 was waiting for P3, and P3 was waiting for P1 back. Now, if you impose a total ordering of the resource types, According to what? Well, according to whatever you wish. Okay. But there is an enumeration. Like, let's say, disk is number one, printer is number two, this shared variable is number three, that shared variable is number four, whatever. And the processes can request these resources only in this increasing order. Then you cannot have the condition where one is waiting for a resource that was held by another because it that would require that that process is making the request not in the increasing order which is not allowed here. So uh, that could be another way of uh, breaking the deadlock. Uh, so you will have prevented uh, the occurrence of a deadlock. So an example is here. Like we have two methods, two functions, each to be executed by a different uh, thread or by a different process, doesn't matter. So uh, here we have the example for the uh, threads, but it's same for the processes. So uh, in this, in the first one, in the function named do work one, which is executed by the first thread, uh, it's first asking a mutex lock first for first, then for the second, then it does some work. It takes some time to execute that work, whatever it is. And then it releases those resources one by one. Whereas in the second thread, it's again asking for the same mutexes, but in the reverse order. Now there is the possibility that in the scheduling, the scheduler first executes the first mutex lock request from the first thread and then before giving the mutex lock for the second it does a context switch to the other thread so the second lock is given to the second thread now the second thread cannot continue because the first lock first mutex was locked by the first mutex so it has to wait until this one completes but it cannot proceed either because that's waiting for the second mutex, which is held by the second process. So there is a crisscross relation between these two processes, these two threads, sorry. Therefore, both threads will be deadlocked. So in other words, it, it's possible that a single process can go into deadlock by itself, but it could have the deadlock only between its two threads. So if it's a 
a single threaded application is not possible, but it is possible even between the threads of the same process. Because uh, threads are just uh, like separate processes. Uh, with lock ordering, how we can proceed? Now, let's look at this example. We're doing a bank transaction operation. We have two locks, one for the account from which you're doing the transaction and the other for the destination account. So, for example, you're trying to transfer uh, some amount from account A to account B. So, you get the lock in an order from the first to the second. Okay? From the from account to the to account. Once you get both of these locks, then you can transfer the money, withdraw from one account and deposit into the other, and then release the locks. This looks fine, right? Because the locks are also acquired in an ordered manner. Now look at this scenario. At the same time, in the bank, there are two transactions going on. One is transferring, let's say, $25 from A to B, and at the same time, another transaction is going from B to A. And assume the following. These two transaction operations are being executed almost at the same time. So transaction one gets the lock from the from account for the from account, but before it gets the lock for the second one, transaction two wants to do the operation, but from the point of view of transaction one, from is A, so it has acquired, transaction one has acquired lock for A, and it will be asking for B, but before it can even attempt to do it, we do have a context switch. So transaction one wants to transfer money in the reverse direction from B to A. So for transaction two, from is B, not A. So transaction two B, Two gets B, luck for B. And it wants luck for A here. Unfortunately, it cannot get it because it's held by transaction one. So transaction one waits for two, two waits for one, and still you have the deadlock. So even in that case, you do have the possibility of a deadlock.